How's it going everyone? This is my hello and, well, this video is very different from a typical Let's Play video, but this is related to my Let's Play videos. So last summer, I started a blind Let's Play of Kingdom Hearts 1, and the main part of the Let's Play ended in October, and all the bonus stuff was fin finished by, like, like, between spring and winter, I think. But um, I did express interest in doing blind let's plays of potentially more Kingdom Hearts games, like Kingdom Hearts 2. But I also expressed that I wasn't interested in doing a let's play for uh, Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, which is a game that comes between Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. And personally, by all means, it should have been a spin off. Considering that it's, you know, on a whole different console, it's a handheld game, you know, it doesn't have... It's very different in many ways. Well, I mean, it was a handheld game before it was re-released on the PlayStation 2 as Re-Chain of Memories, which is the version that's on 1.5 Remix, but, um... No, actually, this game is actually pretty important. It's not just a throwaway spin-off slash interqual, but it's part two of a story, whereas Kingdom Hearts... 2 is part 3 of the same story, or maybe part 4, I guess, depending on, but, um, I tried playing Chain of Memories on the 1.5 Remix to see what it's like to see if I would like it, because I did say that I was going to watch the cutscenes instead of play the game or do a let's play of it, but I tried playing the game to see what it's like, and I didn't get far. I wasn't too impressed with what I saw. Um, it probably has a lot to do with the gameplay, which I wasn't a big fan of. You know, the gameplay is pretty much using... It's like this, it's like... Standard Kingdom Hearts combat, except every single one of your actions is dictated by cards in your deck. So, I understand that some people appreciate that there's more strategy involved in ch the Chain of Memories gameplay, and I agree with that, you know. Like in Kingdom Hearts 1, I got, it got to a point where I got a bit too comfortable just mashing the X button, whereas, you know, you kind of have to be more thoughtful of what of your actions and chain of memories, but my impression is that I wasn't really having fun with the card gameplay, and there were two things that bothered me that I wasn't really looking forward to. A, the cards, which made me think, you know, I'm not going to enjoy this further down the road. Maybe it gets better, but I'm not getting my hopes up. And two, um, so Chain of Memories is themed around Sora's memories of his adventures in Kingdom Hearts 1. So most, if most of the worlds except for one, are all rehashes of the worlds you have visited in Kingdom Hearts 1. Now from what I've heard, they kind of changed the stories of the worlds so that they're more themed around memories, but even then, it's only like slight modifications and it kind of follows the stories of Kingdom Hearts 1 by you know, by a book, and what happens in the Disney worlds is very isolated from what happens in the main story. So, you know, like I said, there's like one exception to this whole world thing when it comes to like rehashes, but I really wasn't excited with the idea of revisiting the same environments as in Kingdom Hearts 1. I understand, I understand why, because, you know, it's memories, but... I wasn't excited for the game at all, so I gave up partway into Traverse Town, which is not far at all, I know. You know, you may say I never gave the game a chance, but I think I gave it the game enough of a chance, because honestly, Chain of Memories is significant because of its story, because there's a lot of story that happens that I bet is very significant to Kingdom Hearts 2. Um, some, some of my... Well, before I can go into my impressions of the story, there were some things that I've noticed, of course. Um, the biggest thing was that Sora's voice changes all of a sudden. Like, he goes to super puberty just by walking down a path. Like, the last... Here's the last bit of dialogue from Sora from Kingdom Hearts 1. Guys, let's go! And here's the first bit of dialogue from Sora in Chain of Memories, which doesn't take place too long afterwards. Seriously? Me too. One look at this castle, and I just knew. Now, I know why um, Sora's voice is changed all of a sudden. 
because I think re Chain of Memories was. So the original Chain of Memories did not have voice acting because it was on the Game Boy Advance, but re Chain of Memories on the PS2 was made after Kingdom Hearts 2, long after the voice actor for Sora pretty much went through puberty and you know had a deeper voice. So it's just a little jarring. <laughs> anyway, so I thought the story was pretty neat. Um, I'm trying to go. I might go, you know what, I think what I'll do for the rest of this video is kind of go over what happens in the story. I know that most of you already know what happens in the story, but I just want to, um, I guess, show how much I understand the story, because what I, what I think is the most important regarding Chain of Memories is understanding the story and the characters that are introduced, since that's the whole point, because it's like preparation for Kingdom Hearts 2. So, it's more f to show that... I comprehend the story rather than to introduce you to the story of you know chain of memories because I'm sure you know the story because I'm sure you're all Kingdom Hearts fans if you're watching this video. So uh, let's see. So let's begin. So chain of memories begins more or less after Kingdom Hearts one, after we defeat, after Sora defeats Ansem, but gets separated from Riku who gets shut behind the door. And also separated from Kairi because the worlds got separated from each other as a result of Ansem um, being defeated. So uh, Sora, Donald, and Goofy go search for Riku and King Mickey Mouse. And they eventually come across a robed, cloaked figure who takes Sora and the rest into what is called Castle Oblivion. And once they set foot, what happens is that they all forget their skills and abilities. And they're told by the cloaked figure that they have to revisit their memories. And there's a potential of finding the, their lost ones, like Riku and Mickey. But they're warned that they will lose their memories as they go on. And, you know, Sora begins traveling through worlds that he's been to, like Traverse Town. Or all the Disney worlds. But in between, he comes across various characters, like... The cloaked figure again, who I guess they're about to fight, but then another guy in a cloak, Axel, shows up, fights, and then they continue on with their journey. Um, I guess throughout you see like moments of this girl drawing, but along the way as they climb up Castle Oblivion, Sora, Goofy, and Donald begin to lose memories of their past adventures, like what is the name of the castle in which Sora stabbed himself and then became a heartless? Hal Halala Hale Halleberry, I guess. <laughs> of course, we could always look at Jiminy's journal, except his journal is empty, which means rip my completion and my progress in that game, am I right? <laughs> so I guess there's like this tagline regarding Castle Oblivion. To find is to lose, and to lose is to find. But they assured themselves that, you know, they can't forget about their friends, you know. Kind of like when Sora turned into a Heartless, when he was, you know, he didn't forget about his friends. Meanwhile, we're introduced to a few characters all wearing cloaks, like Axel and Larxene. Larxene. Is that how we say the name? Larxene? They're pretty interested in the fact that Sora became a Heartless, but then came back which is indicative of how strong his heart is. And they say that only one other person was able to do it. And then they reveal that they're part of this organization that deals with unlocking the mysteries of the heart. Meanwhile, um, you know, Sora begins, you know, Sora's still talking about stuff like Kairi and his charm or his promise made to uh, Kairi. But then he suddenly remembers another girl who he remembers somehow is an old childhood friend that he never remembered until now. So the reasoning is that, you know, as they lose more memories, perhaps as you go deeper into your memories that you lose, you remember the memories that are way down deep. So maybe that's how Sora remembered this one girl. So... Later on, Larsen goes and vis you know challenges Sora. Although Axel does warn her to take it easy on him, since they need Sora to take over the organization. But um, Larsen, well, first of all, let me just say that Larsen is a bitch. 
um, sadistic and interesting, but she's a bitch. So in their encounter, she taunts Sora about the girl, being like, what's your name if she's so special to you? But through their encounter, uh, Sora remembers that the girl's name was Namine. So once Larxene retreats after their fight, uh, Axel and Larxene are joined by a guy named Vexen, whose design I'm not a big fan of. I don't really like Vexen because he seems annoying, but he seems to be a scientist since he experiments on stuff. And then he's talking about one of his experiments that he wants to use on Sora, and we see a brief shot of Riku dressed in his dark self, you know, his costume from Hollow Bastion when he fought Sora. So what's up with that? Well, eventually Sora finds Riku, so it's, a nice, it's, like, it's like a nice reunion, except Riku ends up being super angsty about how Sora pretty much, you know, dropped off his promises and cares only about Namine, so they fight. And the thing is, apparently Sora and Riku fight like four times in this game, so I trust that the boss battles, you know, change in nature over time because fighting the same guy four times is a little too much, don't you think? I mean, maybe it's like Pokemon and rivals, but still. So, at some point, I think Axel and Namine say, like, they're nobodies who can never hope to be somebodies or something like that, so I guess they don't have hearts. And eventually it gets to a point where Sora begins to forget about Kairi herself, because at one point when he talks about his memories, his childhood memories, he talks about himself, Riku, and Namine, and the promise that he, you know, is keeping to Namine. Eventually, when you go back to the organization people, uh, the cloaked figure from before comes and we're introduced. Well, it turns out this cloaked figure is a dude with pink hair and roses named Marluxia, who is the owner of the castle. Also, he's number 11 of this organization, whereas, you know, Vexen was number 4. So, eventually Vexen, you know, can, you know, meets Sora, and then Sora kind of believes that Vexen is kind of controlling Riku, considering that Riku's been acting weird. So they fight, and then Vexen gives Sora a card to a world, and he says this card is crafted, is crafted from the memories from the other side of Sora's heart. So while Sora goes into this new world, the organization, such as um, Axel and Malusha, mark Vexen as a traitor to the organization. So Axel is sent to eliminate the traitor, as is the rule. So Sora, Goofy, and Donald go to this place called Twilight Town. So most of the worlds they've visited, you know, were worlds they've had memories of since they've been there, but. No one has memories of Twilight Town, despite the fact that all of these worlds are supposed to be from, you know, Sora's memories. So they're pretty confused by that. So they go to this mansion, and what Sora says is that it's unfamiliar, but it's also kind of familiar as well. Like, he, it kind of feels like he's been there before. It's not like Sora remembering Namine, you know, gradually, but more like he just feels like he's been there before, even though he knows he hasn't. But later on, Vexen shows up, they fight, but then Vexen begins talking about Marluxia and a bunch of other interesting stuff before he gets attacked by Axel. Because, well, I guess Vexen has been talking too much, and you know, Vex you know, Axel was sent to kill Vexen for being a traitor, so Vexen fucking dies. Goodbye. Holy shit. Damn, Axel. Anyway, so. Basically, Axel pretty much rejoins Marluxia and Larsine, who are revealed to be, you know, going about their plan of taking over the organization. And now Axel is a part of, of this rebellion. Ooh. So part of their plan of taking over the organization revolves around using Sora and Namine. So later on, Sora finds Riku again, and then they talk about Namine. Riku talks about his childhood memory he has of Namine, except it turns out that he and Sora had the exact same memory of them making a promise to Namine. So this confuses Riku, so I'm sure they fight again, but they talk about their charms, and what happens is that at some point, uh, Sora's charm did he 
got from Kyrie at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, changes into a star and he claims that it's a charm from Namine. And I guess Riku also has Namine's charm, but it turns into a card which takes which can take Sora to an, another world. And at this point, Sora begins kind of, uh, well, it's more like Goofy and Donald begin confronting Sora about the whole thing with Namine, about how he's just been very inconsistent. Um, you know, he's been very inconsistent, actually, about his memories of Namine, because by this point, Sora is solely driven by trying to save Namine, because he, I think, realizes that Namine is in danger in the castle Oblivion. So Namine is all he thinks about, but it's very inconsistent with the Sora from before. So they want to talk to Sora about this because it seems like he's a bit too obsessed with Namine, but Sora kind of, well, fights back, they argue, and they break up, Sora goes alone. All I can say about that moment is that Sora is a fucking bitch. What's that mean? What is the matter with you guys? Then do whatever you want. You can lay back and take a nap for all I care. But considering that he's going through a lot with his memories, kind of going through a roller coaster ride, I guess it's acceptable, I guess. But so while Sora goes to the memories of the ruined Destiny Islands, Axel allows Naminé to escape. And Axel kind of notices that despite not having a heart, he's having feelings of enjoyment weird. So, at Destiny Islands, Sora finds Namine at last, and they're about to have a tender moment and when the real Namine shows up and pretty much stops Sora, Sora from falling for the memory Namine, and the real Namine reminds Sora of the one who truly matters to Sora, Kairi. Although Sora doesn't remember Kairi's name, his charm turns back into Kairi's charm. So, later on, so basically Sora remembers that the person who is the most special to him is not Namine, but someone who gave him the charm. And yet again, Sora and Riku meet and they clash, except Namine kind of shuts down Riku, kind of paralyzes him. A uh, large scene says Namine smashed his heart, but... Larsine also reveals a few things that are interesting. This Riku that Sora's been encountering in Castle Oblivion was a fake, a replica. Vexen's replica, actually. And she also reveals that Namine is the one who has been responsible for modifying Sora's memories. So Larsine says that the organization wanted to use the Keyblade Master, or Sora, as a puppet. But because Axel let Namine go, their plans are all messed up. So she's aware that Axel kind of betrayed their cause, as it turns out, because, you know, Axel is actually a double agent. So Larsine's about to attack, but Donut and Goofy rejoin, and then they fight, and then Larsine gets killed in the fight, so girl, bye. She was interesting, though, so she died still. So Namine and Sora talk. She offers to help gives Sora his memories back, and as it turns out, Namine is not a bad person for, you know, ru you know, tampering with Sora's memories. I mean, she was responsible, but she was forced into the situation by Marluxia because Marluxia um, threatened her, saying that she's going to be alone in the castle forever, which would suck. Meanwhile, Axel confronts Marluxia. Re revealing that he's a double agent and then they fight but then I guess Marluxia previously found Namine and uses her as a shield but Axel's all, Axel's all like nah I don't care about her I don't care about attacking her which is very unfortunate because both Axel and Sora have the worst timing ever because Sora hears that and then Marluxia kind of frames it as Axel's a bitch kill him so Sora and Axel fight while Marluxia gets away except Sora beats Axel, Axel retreats, and Sora goes after Marluxia, so... Yeah. So when Sora finds Marluxia, Marluxia orders Namine to erase all of Sora's memories, which will result in Sora's heart being destroyed. So Namine refuses to do that, but Sora tells her to do so. So, I guess one thing that should be clarified is that 
Um, while Sora does not have any memories of Namine, of course, because of Namine's memory tampering, his feelings for Namine, his feelings of you know, protecting her, making sure that she's okay, those were real, and that's what motivates him, and that's what motivates, and that's what helps motivate him in telling Namine to erase his memories. Although that kind of becomes a non-issue because Replica Riku comes and saves the day, distracts Marluxia, Namine is free, and they fight Marluxia, except it's not the real Marluxia, it's a Marluxia illusion. But then, uh, while Mar Replica Riku protects Namine, Sora fights the real Marluxia, and then Marluxia dies with a big ass groan. <laughs> And later on, Sora and uh, Replica Riku depart, where Replica Riku, as he leaves, says he admires that Sora's feelings were real and that he's a good guy. And Namin explains um, the nature of memories to Sora, saying that she didn't actually erase Sora's memories. It's more like when you remember something, you remember something else associated with it. So memories are linked to each other as if in a chain, a chain of memories. So what Namini did was not erase Sora's memories, but take apart the links and rearrange them. So she offers Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy um, the chance to reconfigure their chain of memories so that they're back to normal as they still have their memories. However, this will take time and there's also the condition or stipulation that none of them will be able to, able to remember what happened in the castle, and none of them will be able to remember Namine. Sora has to choose between regaining his memories but forgetting Namine, or remembering Namine but forgetting all of his past memories. Sora chooses to regain his memories, to the disappointment of Namine, who still helps. Oh, okay. Nobody needs to keep a bunch of memories that aren't real, right? You want to remember all of the people who are really important to you. Anybody would choose that. But, you know, they say some encouraging things like Jiminy uh, wrote in his journal to thank Namine when they wake up. So Namine takes them to, I think, the top of the castle or the 13th floor where there are these chambers that Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy can sleep in, where their memories can be restored. So, as Sora and Namine are about to part ways, Sora reveals that, you know, once again, his memories weren't real, but his feelings were real. And they make a promise to meet again. While they might not have a memory, um, they can still meet later on as friends, and they can try to make a friendship. So, you know, it's a nice goodbye. And then Sora goes to cheap, uh, sleep inside of his chamber, where he remembers Kairi and all of his friends again. So, yay! So in the credits sequence, we see scenes of Kairi still waiting on Destiny Island since she was left alone. Thanks, Sora. Uh, we also see a scene of Axel being okay and kind of talking with Replica Riku in the castle. And we also see a scene of this boy um, in what appears to be Twilight Town. And that ends Sora's story, but as it turns out, there's another story you unlock by completing Sora's story. But I guess my thoughts on Sora's story, I guess, overall? I thought it had a very slow start, but it gets pretty interesting near the end, especially where you kind of fig figure out that, you know, it was Namine who was tampering with Sora's memories, instead of the fact that Sora was just remembering an old childhood friend. So. I assume that the important things to note from Sora's stories are that he goes into a deep slumber to get his memories back. Um, and there's this organization with mysterious people. Now, Marluxia, Larsine are dead. Axel is still around, I think. Vaxxin is dead. But there may be more. There may be more. And indeed, there are more members who are introduced to in Chain of Memories because there's also Riku's story, which I think was overall more interesting than Sora's. So the thing is, Riku's story happens at the same time as Sora's story, so 
I guess when I'm going to be recounting Riku's story, like at some point the story will kind of take place at the same time as certain moments in Sora's story. So they happen in parallel. But I don't know. I'd say it's a more interesting story than Sora's story. Like Sora's story is all like, yeah, it's okay. Him getting bitchy about Namine. Uh, I don't think I would have enjoyed that if I were playing the game, but... Um, yeah, so... On to Riku, I guess. So Riku is kind of in some coma, in some realm between the light and the darkness after the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. And he's alone, but then this voice talks to him and gives him a card that can allow him to face the truth. And by touching this card, Riku ends up in Castle Oblivion, the basement of Castle Oblivion. So whenever Sora's climbing the castle, Riku is in the basement, I guess. So after going through a memory, Riku comes across Ansem. Not real Ansem, but more like the Ansem inside of his heart, because as it turns out, Riku still has some darkness inside of his heart. Although uh, Mickey offers to help every now and then by having like light appear to protect Riku from Ansem, but you know, they fight and then stuff. And we're introduced to a few more characters. We see Fexen again, but we also see two guys named uh, Lexeus and Zexion. So Zexion detects Riku in the basement, but he doesn't know who it is, and he thinks this person is similar to their quote, superior. Meanwhile, as Riku is going through the castle, he begins to be able to smell darkness which is how he can kind of smell or detect other people in the castle. And I guess other, well, people of the organization and Ansem. So while that happens, Mickey appears as an illusion and they talk about light and darkness and light and darkness about how they should fight light. It gets crazy. Just because darkness holds you, don't let go of who you are. You've got to fight the darkness inside you. It won't be easy to do, I know. But please don't forget, even in the darkest darkness, there's always a little bit of light. Light within darkness. You and I have seen it. The far welcoming light inside the door to darkness. The light of Kingdom Hearts, it will show you the way. Please don't give up, believe in the light. Later on, um, Zexion, 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 uh, whatever, he recognizes that the person inside of the basement is Riku, and he realizes that the reason why he thought, his, you know, his existence had doubled was because of the presence of Ansem inside of his heart, which, you know, led to their, the whole confusion with the superior thing. So, they also realized that the dark power given to Riku was what allowed him to escape from the realm of darkness, but they're confused about why Riku ended up in Castle Oblivion. Meanwhile, they're aware of Sora, but they're pretty interested in Riku only. They're also aware of how Marluxia is using Namine in the plans, but Marluxia never consulted Zexion or Lexius, so they don't feel happy about that. Later on, Fexen meets Riku, and when Riku asks who he is and if he knows Ansem, Fexen says that he is familiar with an Ansem with which Riku is not familiar. Kind of like an Ansem, but not Ansem. A nobody. One that walks the twilight between light and dark, like Riku himself. So they fight, but as it turns out, Fexen uses the fight to get Riku's battle data, and he escapes. So, oops. Meanwhile, Sexion and Lexius observe what is happening to Sora as he is losing his memories in his story, and they note that Sora would be pretty useful to the organization, but they're kind of left a bit uneasy by Marluxia and Larsine, and they didn't really know what to think of Axel since they're kind of uncertain about him. Meanwhile, Vexen reveals that he created a replica of Riku from the battle data, but, and he plans to use the replica, but Zexion and Lexius know that Vexen doesn't really like Marluxia, but they want Vexen to just go ahead and deal with whatever conflict by himself, and yeah, there's a lot of conflicts in this organization. I, I thought this was an organized organization. 
So much fighting, jeez. <laughs> Later on, Miku reads that Replica Riku made by Vexen, and Replica Riku says that he can use the darkness and embrace the darkness that Riku himself is afraid of, and he calls the real Riku a coward. But you know, they fight, and Replica Riku retreats, and Riku kind of has another episode with Ans- As it turns out, Riku and Ansem have a lot of conversations, much like how Sora and Replica Riku have a lot of confrontations, so... A lot of that happening. A lot of the whole... Or whatever music that plays. The same, the same music always plays in the same scenes, I've noticed. So, we see that cutscene of Larsine, Axel, and Vexen, and Replica Riku again, except now that we know that this Riku is a replica. Oh, so I guess it's interesting because like the cutscenes of Riku's story assume that you know what already happened in Sora's story, so they kind of treat you with more respect regarding knowledge and details of the game. So we know we see more of this cutscene now that we know that now that we know that this Riku is a replica. So Vexen and Larsine believe that with Namine's help, with her ability to modify memories. They can give Replica Riku the real Riku's memories so as to further fuck with Sora. Now, Replica Riku is not happy about this, but after he tries to attack Larsine, it doesn't really work out, and then he's going to get his memories changed, but he screams, No! And later on, we see, this, we see a scene of Larsine and Namine, ex where Larsine is being a bitch as per usual, except Replica Riku defends Namine, being like, I must do whatever I can to protect my childhood friend Namine. So it turns out that Namine was successful in altering Replica Riku's memories. So Larsine is pretty excited about Namine's capabilities and how she can super change Sora's memories, but Namine says that she is aware of how Sora will never forget Kairi, and she says that she is the shadow of Kairi. So fast forward to when Axel kills Vexen. Zexion and Lexius notice that happens, so they're a little worried about Sora, I guess, but they're all like, you know, maybe we can use the dark. Let's recruit Riku, because they know about Marluxia's rebellion against the organization, so they want to use Riku as, I guess, a soldier against Marluxia. So Lexius goes to meet Riku, and they fight. Lexius tells Riku to embrace his darkness, and after he hits Riku, Riku ends up harnessing the darkness after being knocked into submission, and Riku, with the power of darkness, instantly kills Lexius. To the point where Lexi's all, all like, Shit, we shouldn't have done this. This is a fight we never should have done. This is a mistake. Oh no. But because Riku tampered with the darkness, Ansem is able to perhaps take control of his body again, and perhaps take control of his heart again. Except Mickey intervenes by shielding him from Ansem. So, thanks Mickey. So after Larsine is dead, Sexion and Axel talk about stuff like how Larsine, Lexius, and Vexen are dead, and Marluxia is next because this was after Axel fights Sora while Sora is fighting Marluxia. So, Sexion, you know, talks to Axel about how they wanted to use Riku to deal with the traitors in the organization, but now that the traitors are kind of already being taken care of already, Riku is kind of a nuisance and they should get rid of him because he might be a threat. So, Sexion asks Axel for data for the Destiny Islands. Meanwhile, Riku senses Marluxia's defeat because it's pretty much causes an earthquake that can be felt even in the basement. And later on, Sexion comes and pretty much confirms the very same thing that Riku was able to guess. Although, through Sexion's dialogue, Riku learns that Sora is inside of the castle, which he never knew of before until now. But Sexion says that Sora is the guy who fights darkness, but, you know, Riku now has darkness inside of him, so that he is darkness, so they're pretty much on opposite sides, which is a conflict. So Zexion gives Riku a card that takes him to Destiny Islands, where he eventually is told that he was the one who destroyed Destiny Islands. So I can only guess that Destiny, Destiny Islands was attacked and destroyed because that door in the tunnel in the cave was opened. Supposedly, it was Riku who opened that door, because he was the guy who wanted to leave the islands and have some greater destiny or whatever. 
but after some fights, Riku finds Sora, but Sora begins attacking Riku because they are on opposite sides. Sora is of the light, Riku is of the dark. So Sora pretty much shoots Riku with light that pretty much makes him about to die from the light. As, you know, about to become, he's about to fade away into the light. But then he sees Kairi. It's actually Namine, but she's speaking through a memory of Kairi, who says that Riku cannot fade and that neither light nor dark can vanquish Riku, but both can strengthen him and that Riku has no need to be afraid of the darkness, and without giving in, one can perhaps escape the deepest darkness and see the brightest light. So basically what she says is, Riku can control the power of darkness and use it to his best advantage. And so that's how he gets out of Sora's attack, that's how he attacks Sora, who was actually Zexion in acting as Sora. And then they fight, Zexion Sexian retreats, you know, because he's a little afraid of Riku, who is now no longer afraid of the darkness. So Zexian is confused and kind of shocked that Riku can control the darkness, and he's confronted by Axel and Replica Riku. Now, this is after that one scene in the credits in Sora's story, so they must have talked because now Axel offers Replica Riku a chance to be a real person by getting power that the real Riku doesn't have, so that by absorbing a new power, he can be his own person. So he absorbs Zexion's power. In other words, Zexion dies. So rip, moody hair dude. Although, Axel says something interesting. So now that Riku has accepted the darkness, Ansem comes again and taunts him and is about to take control of his body, but then Mickey helps out, except he actually appears. And as it turns out, he also escaped the realm of darkness by getting a card from a voice. And this card takes Riku to Twilight Town, where Riku meets Ansem, except he knows that this Ansem is not the real Ansem because they have a diff different smell. And as it turns out, this fake Ansem was the same person who talked to Riku in the beginning, who guided him away from the realm of darkness into Castle Oblivion. So this fake Ansem reveals himself as Diz. Now, of course, you can think of an obvious joke regarding his name. Diz Nuts. Whoa. I'm the first person to say that. So D Diz tells Riku that he is between light and darkness and twilight. Eh, Twilight Town. How appropriate. <laughs> so he tells Riku that he must meet Namine and then choose, which is kind of vague, but Riku goes to the mansion where he can potentially find Namine, and then Replica Riku confronts him. Even with Zexion's powers, he realizes that he's still a fake and not his own person, and that he's all empty inside, which is pretty depressing. You know, he really had no purpose or any sort of meaning. But they fight, and then Replica Riku dies, so... Anyway, so Riku finds Namine, and he also finds Sora inside of his chamber asleep. So Namine kind of catches Riku up to speed up about what happened, and then she warns Riku about his darkness inside of him, because while Ansem is dormant at the moment, he can always strike later on. So Namine offers to lock Riku's heart, but in the process, Riku will have to forget all of his memories. So he has the same he's given the same choice that Sora was given. But unlike Sora, Riku chooses to keep his memories without locking his heart. And that dark he says that darkness can show him the way if Ansem strikes, mean, meaning that he is ready to face Ansem. Also, he kind of ends his meeting with Namine with some awkward line. You and Kairi smell the same. So outside, he comes across Mickey and Diz, and Diz gives Riku and Mickey cloaks. So the same cloaks that the organization members wear. He warns them that the organization will want to hunt Riku and Mickey down, but the cloak can A. Shield them from detection by the organization, and B. Protect them from being devoured by the darkness. And Diz says that even the organization cannot rule the darkness. And then he gives a card to Riku, which Riku uses to face Ansem on his own terms. So they fight, and Ansem is vanquished for now, since Ansem's all like, I'll still come back later on. 
By the way, can we acknowledge the fact that Ansem's voice sounds very different in this game compared to Kingdom Hearts 1? Like, he sounds a lot like Lawrence Fishburne or Morpheus from The Matrix, don't you think? Am I the only one? I know this voice is so different from Kingdom Hearts 1. I like this voice in KH1. What gives? Kingdom Hearts! Fill me with the power of darkness! I have watched you fight. I know your strength. Your skill with darkness has grown. It has become more mature. Anyway, so after Riku escapes the encounter, thanks to Mickey, Mickey offers to join Riku on his journey. So they leave in cloaks and, you know, they meet this. This is all like, road to light, road to darkness, and Riku's all like, the road to dawn. So they leave off on their journey of, well, being between light and darkness and growing stronger. I suppose. And then we see more of this boy in Twilight Town. And we see that Axel not only finds the boy, but hangs out with the boy. They kind of sit on top of a clock tower eating ice cream. Although I guess Axel doesn't like ice cream. <laughs> and then we see some other things like another cloaked dude, another organization member meeting or confronting Namine and Diz. And we also see the fact that, you know, the the organization, they had a lot of conf they, The organization lost five of their own members due to petty internal conflicts. So, I assume that there's, there's like what eight remaining, but they're not off to a good start if they're going to be important to Kingdom Hearts 2. So, like I said before, I was more impressed with Riku's story than I was with Sora's story, since you know Sora's story was kind of basic compared to Riku's story. And there's a lot more intrigue with the more interesting organization members, really. Although, yeah, I mean, there's also the fact that you, you kind of already know more about what happens in Castle Oblivion and the organization in Riku's story, as it is to re-whatever. So, yeah, it's interesting how, to see what these new characters will do. Although, obviously, the only character from the organization that we've met in Chain of Memories who will be in later games is Axel. So what were my impressions of the story and characters? Well, I already said some of my impressions of some of the characters like Larsine is interesting because she's a bitch, but she's cool. Zexion and... Zexion's alright. Luxia's a little... dry. Faxon, I don't... there's something about him that I don't like, so... I wasn't sorry to see him go. Marluxia... He's like the main antagonist in Sora's story, but I feel like there wasn't enough build-up around him so that he kind of felt like an empty character. I mean, I know that he was the one who took Sora to Castle Oblivion, but it didn't seem like he was doing anything else. Like, much of his achievements were, like, in the background, you know, like, controlling Namine and such, but Marluxia was kind of boring, I guess. Axel was pretty cool, though. He was... You know, he was cool. Like, I feel like if he weren't on the opposite side, he would have been like an older brother figure to Sora. And indeed, he kind of seems like an older brother figure to that one dude in Twilight Town. I like Namine. She was cool. Um, I kind of... One might say that I might even like her more than Kairi. Although, I guess it's, it's fitting since she is Kairi's shadow after all. Replica Riku, you know... Eh. Yeah. yeah. That's all I have to say about that. Anyway, the story was... The story was interesting. Um, I feel like it was appreciably... I appreciated that the fact that it was much more complex than the story of Kingdom Hearts 1. Since I did kind of say, like, the Kingdom Hearts... In Kingdom Hearts 1, the story kind of takes the backseat for a lot, of the, a lot of the game. Except near the end, although I believe in Sora's story, this story might be in the same format where like the story takes a backseat during the whole Disney world exploration and it only picks up when you go to Twilight Town, I assume. But, you know, and I, I guess like Riku's might have the same structure maybe, but it seemed like more stuff was going on in Riku's story, even as Riku might be going through Disney worlds. But I guess what I've noticed is, is something that's kind of consistent with what people had to say about Chain of Memories. What people had to say about Chain of, Chain of Memories is that it was truly optimized to be a handheld game. 
and they say that in both in terms of presentation and gameplay. Where for gameplay, you know, the fact that you're just moving 2D help the gameplay, the card gameplay immensely. Whereas the fact that in the re, you know, in re chain of memories, the fact that it's in 3D with much more open space, with much more variability, which may not be a good thing if you're limited to just using cards to dictate every single one of your actions. So people seem to say like the whole 2D to 3D shift wasn't really good for the card mechanic. So maybe I can see that it kind of did feel very awkward and clunky, but. There's also the fact that the presentation kind of seemed to fit the fact that it was supposed to be a handheld game. You know, you kind of play the game on on the go. It's the stuff that happens in the Disney worlds is kind of isolated, but maybe that's the point. It's it's a handheld game, and the intriguing story stuff is only the stuff that happens in between, and it's only like short scenes. And I mean, I did watch a video where it's all like cutscenes cut together, so it kind of feels like it's like fade away, fade in. Fade away, fade in, fade away. It was all like super episodic, but the way the presentation was done, I feel like maybe that's how the cutscenes are, even with in the context, even in the context of the game. But who am I to judge? I've never played the game myself, have I? <laughs> but yeah, um, so that's been Chain of Memories. Um, I do. People have told me that it is important when it comes to building up the story of Kingdom Hearts 2 and you know it does have its place in the Kingdom Hearts timeline it's just I'm not sure if I feel good about how Kingdom Hearts treats what should be spin-off games as main entries in the, in the series but then label oh this is like the actual main entry by the way Kingdom Hearts 2 even though it's like the third or fourth game but um you may be wondering so why did you bother going through this whole video of like you talking about Chain of Memories for 40 minutes if you didn't let's play it or anything anything like that well i mean it's kind of building up to something else which i mean i've been pretty transparent about the fact that i wanted to do another project in the kingdom hearts series on my channel so my answer to all that is this following trailer <laughs> 